How did Jesus prepare his followers to lead after he was gone? What lessons could today's leaders learn from Jesus? We'll discuss those questions today on Jesus Basics. Welcome to Jesus Basics, who, what, and why it makes a difference. I'm Joe Green speaking to you from South Hadley, Massachusetts. This is the ninth video in a series designed to help you consider one of the most famous people of all time, Jesus of Nazareth. Now we're going through a book of the Bible called the Gospel of John to answer questions like, what did Jesus say and do? And what, make, what difference does that make to us today? There's a discussion guide in the description below, which will help you in your own study or in group study. Today we're covering John chapters 13 and 14, and we're not going to really be discussing chapter 14, but I encourage you to read it because there's a lot of great material in there as Jesus prepares his followers for his departure. And that preparation for his disciples, it begins in our focus passage. Jesus, he gathers his disciples to observe a Passover meal, and he's going to teach them a whole lot in this last gathering before he's arrested later that night. Now, John 13, in our focus passage, it introduces a larger unit often referred to as the farewell discourse. It's, it's called that because Jesus is bidding farewell to his followers, and he is preparing them uh, preparing them for his departure by teaching them a whole lot of stuff, a whole lot about uh, their relationship with the Father, their relationship with the Spirit, their relationship with one another, and their relationship with the world, especially after he is gone. And in our focus passage, he symbolically cleanses them through the act of foot washing which is really an object lesson for two things. The first thing is it's an object lesson for Jesus' self-sacrifice on the cross that will cleanse the whole world from sin. But it's also an object lesson for how Christians should lead and treat one another after Jesus is gone. So let's look at our focus, focus passage in two parts. We'll look first at John chapter 13, verse 111. It'll be on your screen. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, he tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing now you do not understand, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you shall have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, The one who is bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew he was to, who was to betray him. That was why he said, Not all of you are clean. All right, the foot washing. The foot washing was the task usually done by the lowest servant. And it makes sense because it was kind of a gross job. People's feet were muddy. They wore sandals. Uh, the, the streets had all sorts of animal stuff on them. So washing feet was for the lowest servant, not for the leader, not for the master. That's why Peter objects at first when Jesus comes to wash his feet because Peter knows, wait a minute, maybe one of the other disciples, maybe I should be washing people's feet, but not Jesus, not the master. And he's going to explain, Jesus is going to explain more in the next section about what this example means for them in the future. But before we move on to the next section, um, I should note that this foot washing, it's an object lesson for the cleansing that Jesus would perform the next day. That's why he says to Peter, you don't understand right now what I'm doing, but you will understand. Because by giving his life on the cross, Jesus has taken on the, most, the lowest task, be dying the, most, uh, the lowest form of death, crucifixion and torture on a cross. But he does that as an act of service to cleanse people from their sins. And, and Peter, again, he doesn't understand that yet, but he will. 
He doesn't understand this display of, the, of, of a lowly service um, from his master. But Jesus says to him in verse 8, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. So this shows us that even the inner 12 disciples, even Peter, needed to be cleansed by Jesus to be a part of his kingdom. Uh, to lead in Jesus' kingdom, you need to be cleansed by Jesus. They must, they must, we must receive his forgiveness and his empowerment given through his sacrificial service at the cross. Uh, or we can go the way of Judas and succumb to the evil one. All right, well, let's uh, continue our focus passage to read it, uh, starting in verse 12. Jesus is going to explain why he did this. It'll be on your screen. Uh, when he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I'm not speaking of all of you. I know whom I've chosen, but the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I'm telling you this now, before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. So Jesus clearly explains to his disciples of, of an example. Give, he gives them, he tells them, I'm giving you an example of what real leadership looks like. They are to humbly serve one another, not to take on leadership to serve themselves. Because if Jesus humbly served them uh, and he is their master, they should humbly serve one another. Now, just a side note, the betrayal that is interwoven throughout this scene that Judas is going to betray uh, Jesus, that's a a betrayal of a friend is a terrible act in Jesus' day. And it was especially heinous because it happened in the context of a meal. And when you ate a meal with someone, it was a symbol of trust and unity. And yet, Jesus wants to make sure that they understand that he didn't make a mistake when he chose Judas. And in fact, he, he, he says that he's chosen Judas to fulfill the role of betrayer that was prophesied in Psalm 41.9. That's why he says, uh, I know whom I've been chosen, uh, so the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. That's a quote of, of Psalm 41.9. Uh, and Jesus, he says, I'm telling you beforehand, because he understands that Judas' betrayal, it might cause them to be filled with doubt. It might cause them, it might shake their faith. So, but instead, Jesus says, no, I'm foretelling this. I'm telling you this ahead of time so that when it all happens, you believe that I am he. That's what verse, uh, chapter 13, verse 19 says. I'm telling you now so that before it takes place, so when it takes place, you believe that I am he. Now, in video six, we talked about this, about how these I am statements that Jesus says, including this one, so that you believe that I am he, it refers to the divine name, the great I am. So Jesus here, he's saying, when this happens, don't doubt that I'm the Son of God. Rather, I'm telling it to you beforehand so that you do know I am the Son of God. And in fact, it's a part of the divine plan. And in fact, my crucifixion is a part of the divine plan. That's what he wants them to know. And, and the apostles bringing Jesus' message, being leaders in Jesus' new community, the new messianic community after Jesus is gone, that's also a part of God's plan. But if they're going to lead, what's needed is they need to lead like Jesus led, with self-sacrifice and with not looking to serve themselves, but to serve others. All right, well, let's ask our questions as we, as we close. What did Jesus say and do? What does it mean for Christianity and what difference does it make today? Well, what did Jesus do, say and do? He took on the lowly task of, of foot washing, the, most, the lowest task of a servant, and he used it as an object lesson to, again, show two things. First, it points to the ultimate act of humble service he will uh, undertake the next day in giving his life to cleanse people from their sins. But it's also an object lesson of how they needed to, to lead uh, when he was gone through self-sacrifice, through humble servant leadership. 
Now, how does that inform the Christian faith, this passage? Well, on a very concrete level, it informs the Christian faith in that there are some Christian traditions who still practice foot washing as a, sort of a ceremony, just like the Lord's Supper. Many Christian traditions also do that on what's called Maundy Thursday. Uh, they reenact this. Um, but I think this passage should inform Christianity even more than it does. And maybe that's why we should just jump to the next question. What difference would it make? It would make a huge difference if Christians and Christian leaders actually follow Jesus' example. Because as church leaders, um, we are tasked, and, and I'm sort of speaking as a church leader, we are tasked to lead like Jesus led. But we're also tasked from this passage to first and foremost understand our utter need for Jesus' cleansing and his empowerment. Because if the apostle Peter needed it, well, then we certainly need it. Leaders are not called to lead from our own strength or to lead from a place that, oh, I've become perfect, so now I can lead. We're called to lead in Jesus' kingdom from our weakness, from our deep understanding of our own need for cleansing, our own need for forgiveness from God. And being cleansed, it means acknowledging our weakness, acknowledging our inability to conquer the enemies ourselves. And when I say the enemies, I mean our own enemies of sin, of Satan, um, Leaders, we must realize that we're losers apart from Christ. We're losers to sin. We're losers to Satan. We need to understand we need his cleansing in order to then experience his victory of when he rose from the dead over sin, over Satan, and all of those things that would take us down. Um, and of course, that applies to any person. Every Christian should seek to serve one another, but it goes double for Christian leaders. Uh, and I think that's important because in some organizations, it's almost as if, well, the leaders are held to one standard and, uh, you know, do as I say, don't do as I do. Uh, and, you know, the other people, they'll just, uh, you know, they need to do this, but leaders don't know. In Christianity, the leaders, it goes double. They, they need cleansing. They need dependence on Jesus, just like everyone else. And there's no task that's too low. It's beneath them. Uh, they need to serve like Jesus served. Because that's the other thing Jesus does. He flips worldly leadership on its head, where in the world, generally what happens is that, well, you lead, once you become a leader, then you can use other people, that you're above this. Jesus says no. He gives this object lesson and says in verse 15, I've given you an example that you would do, uh, uh, that you should do as I have done to you. And in washing the disciples' feet, he took on the lowest task. So Jesus-style leadership means serving. It means it's a servant leadership. It means even serving those who would betray you, who would deny you. Because he washed the feet of Jews. He washes the feet of Peter, who will later deny him. And we don't use our influence uh, to serve self. We use influence to serve Christ and to serve one another. And so we Christian leaders, we need to confess um, Christianity's history of not living up to Jesus' example in this scripture. By not following Jesus' humble way of servant leadership, we have put a stumbling block in front of many people. And non-Christians, they can see it. They can see how many people actually use the Christian faith, especially Christian leaders, to serve themselves, not to serve God, not to serve um, others. And if you are one of those types of people, in other words, the, the failure of the church, the failure of the church leadership has caused you pain, I apologize on behalf of Christian leaders who, but may I urge you, don't let human failure uh, keep you from Jesus. You, we all need cleansing. We all have made mistakes, even Christian leaders. Um, but don't let our failures, don't let the church's failures keep you from Jesus. Rather, let our failures confirm the fact that we all need grace, that uh, from the highest to the lowest, we all need to be cleansed by Jesus. And um, that doesn't give us a free pass to, to do wrong things, but rather it should compel us to even more want to show the world his grace and his love. And we can do that by serving others, by, by following Jesus' style leadership of, of giving ourselves, not for the benefit of others. Um, so these are some things that I hope you contemplate and I hope you apply, whether you're a leader or you're just contemplating Jesus, I hope this helps you discover Jesus' heart. It's a humble heart of servant leadership. It's a heart of self-sacrifice. It's a heart worth following, whether you're new to Christianity or you're a leader. Hope to see you next time on Jesus Basics.